time when it's hardest to get. Mm -hmm. And she had just been a visiting t uh, professor at West Point. And she was pointing out that s some of the students that she had, these, uh, these young men and women that she had, were being deployed in Afghanistan. And uh, we thought it would be a wonderful idea for people that were really coming out of these very stressful, challenging times in their life to have the kind of clarity that literature brought. So uh, we asked uh, what ultimately became about 40 major American writers. Uh, they're in every genre, you know, from novelists, poets, historians, journalists. They cross the entire political spectrum. And, but they're eminent people like Bobby Ann Mason, Tobias Wolfe. Uh, we have popular writers like uh, um, Tom Clancy. We have, you know, we have poets like Marilyn Nelson. We have uh, uh, sort of journalist historians uh, uh, like uh, Mark Bowden, who wrote Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. And they volunteered to teach writing workshops for the, the troops that were coming out of rotation and their spouses. Because mm -hmm. we actually have a lot of male and female spouses that are, you know, that are part of the home front. So they could write about their wartime experience. And we really thought they did three things. First of all, it gave these people some clarity during these challenging periods of their, of their lives. Secondly, it provides a record of the war that's not the war as politicians describe it, not the war as journalists describe it, but the war as individuals lived it. And finally, it probably is going to produce one of the largest uh, written records of these wars, because most of it's happening on cell phones or in emails mm -hmm. and things like that. So is there an anthology that's going yeah, to Yeah, we're doing an anthology. Yeah. And so we've had, I mean, actually, we've had hundreds of articles uh, written about this program. And a lot of people came in and said, oh, let's go find out how it's politicized. And in New York Times has done three pieces. All three pieces said, what a great program mm -hmm. this is. Because it isn't politicized. It's about bringing art to people who wouldn't get it otherwise. And we, ha and we have an anthology that will come out with the best of, of this work. We've gotten 11,000 pages of submission. And uh, some of this submission is critical of the experience of all war time? All types. It's all over. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm the glad thing you is, we're, that. See, we're not, um, you know, we, we're giving the individual uh, soldier, sailor, marine, pilot, uh, mm. you know, spouse a chance to talk about their own experience. We're not, you know, we're not predetermining what that experience is. Okay. Tell me about another initiative that uh, intrigues me called the Big Read. Well, the, the uh, yeah, big is that read, underway yet? Yeah, or well, is that we're still just about to announce it. Actually, yeah. what it comes out of is, it, is that we did a study of American reading mm -hmm. uh, that was a lugubrious affair. I mean, it was. This is the saddest study that it, you know, that any person who really loves literature could possibly read. Because what we demonstrated from the study, which has a seventeen thousand sample size. I mean, so it's statistically. Uh, 20 times the size of your normal statistical study, perfectly matched to the U.S. population, is that every group of Americans is reading less than they did t 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Uh -huh. Every age group, income group, educational group, racial group, region, and both genders. And in fact, younger Americans have in 20 years gone from the people who read most in our society to the people who read least. And so it's very alarming. Uh, and so. We began to look at this and say, what can you do? Because there's interesting things that happen. We were able to correlate this study with these people's other behaviors across the arts and civic activity. And what we see is that people who read are three times more likely to do volunteer work, charity work, go to the theater. They're four times more likely to go to a museum. They're even twice as likely to go to a ball game, which means that you, you see the country bifurcating into one group which, is, which reads and is very involved in their community. They tend to be more active. Now, they do everything the other group does. They watch TV, they play video games, they have you know, iPods, they go on the internet, but they balance their time better. And there's another group that increasingly just stays home. So we tried to create a program which would, in a sense, uh, create a civic context and civic reinforcement for reading, and, and we're going to call it the Big Read. Okay, so it's not as though you're going to be um, supporting certain books oh, to be read. Oh, we are. We are. Have well, they been chosen yet? What we're doing is it, it comes out of, the, of, a, of a grassroots program we see, which is called the City Reads or the One Book yeah. Programs, where a community chooses a book right. and, then they, and then they read it. So yeah. we're taking this, which is a very nice but somewhat small grassroots idea, and we're going to bump it up to a level that no single community can afford. This goes back to my notion of being able to do things on a broader scale nationally. Is the idea that the whole country will read one book? No, no, no. no. Okay. We're having com communities choose a book 
that they want to read. And we'll develop TV programming, radio programming, reader's guides, school okay. materials, library materials, book club materials. We'll create partnerships with the public radio station, public TV station, the newspaper, the mayor's office, the library, uh, community service groups. So we really have tremendous reach within a community and create a kind of exciting, uh, accessible material that really spurs people's interest. Okay. Because we think one of the things that's vanished in our society is that is that sort of social reinforcement of reading. Because let's say you read a really good book, but Who nobody you know read is, is yeah. reading it. There's nobody to talk to. Right. So we're in a sense right. trying to create uh, socialization around the reading of good books. Okay. Sounds sounds good. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit about uh, you've traveled a great deal for the NEA, and I assume I've you traveled, traveled before every that. Every week for the last three well, years. Well, I, I assume you travel both within the United States, but also abroad. And I'm very interested in what you see when you travel abroad in terms of arts support. I mean, especially in Europe, from what I know, the support of the arts is very different from it is yeah. in this country. Um, everything is very centralized. Um, there's a, a notion of what art is, and it is supported generously by the governments of many countries. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you talk a little bit about those differences and what you think it has meant for the cultural climate of those countries as opposed to the U.S. Well, the, the American system of art support is radically different from everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing is that American artistic culture is vibrant, is diverse, and is dynamic. In Europe, the support of arts comes out of an aristocratic heritage. The kings, the dukes, the popes essentially supported art as an extension of the state. And it stays that way now. And so you tend to have a centralized ministry of culture that supplies a substantial budget for certain numbers of organizations, which sort of means that you're either supported by the government or you really can't exist. Mm. And so it's very lavish if you're on the inside and very crippling if you're on the outside. And yet the cab drivers do read in Paris. Per, I don't, I, I don't I, know. I, yeah, I mean, uh, do you get the sense of a, of a culture well, that's more permeated with well, a sense well, of I art do think, culture. I do think what, what you see in Europe is something that's interesting. Uh, I think the European countries do a superb job of maintaining their national heritage. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, know, you have a country like Italy, you know, which is, does an enormously uh, expert job in terms of restoring buildings, paintings, uh, and also taking a sense of what your national patrimony is and working it into the public education mm -hmm. so people know their own history, know their own art. Uh, their support of contemporary art is more problematic because I think you tend to have the insiders and the outsiders. The American system actually, the American government supports art more than any other country in the world by a huge margin, but we do it in a curious way called the tax deduction which allows you and me and anybody else to give uh, support art of our own choice wherever we want. So we can support you know, an anti-establishmentarian artist in Tulsa uh, or you know, a, uh, a traditional artist in Phoenix or whatever our, our, our own taste is, and the government pays part of that bill. And so, uh, so the American uh, sort of organized support of the art, I mean, the, the National Endowment for the Arts is the largest annual funder of arts in the United States. I mean, we're really in a class by ourselves, and we're actually just under 1% of the total arts budget in the United States. Hmm. And so that shows you that you don't really have the federal government dominating arts. And I think, although that makes the life for American artists a little more difficult, uh, because of the tax deduction and because of public foundations and things like that, which just don't, simply don't exist in Europe to the same extent, that they do have more freedom and more diversity. Uh, and so I think that uh, the American system allows art to be more, more localized, uh, more diverse, and more free from government interference. Although American artists do have to scramble more uh -huh. than their European counterparts. Yeah, they have to be more savvy. But I think that the, the, the proof is in the pudding, and, and I would put the uh, artistic achievement of the United States over the last hundred years against any nation in history. Mm -hmm. We've done things as diverse as uh, modern dance and the graphic novel, abstract expressionism in the movies. Uh, wonderful, wonderful things that you, you wouldn't think being developed at the same time, but, but you know, we've really excelled in almost every major art form. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, we don't have too much time left, but I wondered if you would sketch for us a little bit of some of, uh, some of your, in, your plans, uh, some of the initiatives that you would like to implement in the time that remains for you. Well, the, as, bi the as big read chair. is the thing that, I, you know, we're, we're going to start it off, uh, you know, 
with, with about 10 cities. But I want to go more broadly than any reading program in the history of this country has. Um, and I think that, that we have a moment right now where we still have over half the country sort of actively engaged, sort of adult, adult active engaged literacy. They're reading literary books. They're reading, they're reading books. And I think that we've got to sort of build on, on, on that continuity before it disappears. Because we have a generation coming up for which reading is simply not as important. Hmm. And so I think that that's something that's very, very timely. I also think it's very important to have more international exchanges in the arts. Uh, over the last 20 years, the United States has, has really pulled back from a lot of international exchanges, uh, bringing artists here, bringing our artists abroad. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity. Uh, I think it's, it, it's good for American arts, and I think it's good for the United States to have all of these uh, myriad conversations. That and why really do you exist. think that is that there's been this, this rift, so to speak? Well, I, you know, part of it, it was a, something as, um, as literal as the U.S. Information uh, Agency, which was part of the State Department, which brought artists and intellectuals abroad that was dismantled during, during the Clinton administration because they felt the free market would do it all. Mm -hmm. but the free market won't do it all. Mm -hmm. there's, there are kinds of conversations that I think really do need public support. So uh, on the other hand, uh, America's arts world is so vibrant, we tend to become parochial. We tend to look too, too internally mm. and, uh, and, and close it off. Also, Americans are notoriously monolingual, uh, uh, at least intellectual Americans. I mean, working class Americans like me were raised bilingually, uh -huh. so we, we know it. But if you, if you yeah. go into there, so you don't have these, uh, these the internationalism, I think, that exists in a lot of European or Asian countries. But you know, we- So in a way, it will have to be one way. There, the, 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 the reciprocity will have to be in English, it seems. Well, you know, it's, uh, this could be an opportunity oh. for Americans to have the, you know, <laughs> the greatest language labs in the world. They're called uh -huh. Berlin, Paris, Rome, uh -huh. you know, uh, Prague. Well, that might be another yeah. thing that the NEA could spearhead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, we're, so I, I think education. the international yeah. Uh, yeah, thing is, is, is important. But I think also we have to, if, I, if you ask me the most important thing I can do as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, I think it's to try to revitalize and add excitement to American arts education. Mm. We have a whole generation of Americans who are being raised and being educated in schools where most of the formal arts education has been dropped. Yeah. Uh, if the American I economy uh, is going to compete in a world economy in the 21st century, it's not going to be through cheap labor or cheap raw materials. It's going to be through imagination, innovation, and creativity. And how yeah. can we expect that from a generation that we're not uh, training them in the arts. I think and it's yet that's impossible. been a tradition in this country. The arts programs get cut first, the athletic programs get cut last. And well, I, I, it would be wonderful if that could be changed. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. I mean, I think that we should look, I mean, this doesn't sound too, too radical to me, but I guess for some people it is. I think the arts education program should be as essential to kids' education as sports. Right. I think sports are very important because some kids find themselves and, and, and develop parts of their personality and their character in sports, but they also do it in theater, they do it in the school paper, Absolutely. school magazine, in dance, in visual arts, in band, in chorus, and we have to keep those options open. There should be many paths to success and to self-realization for kids. I would agree with you there. Um, and I hope that for the rest of your tenure, you're going to be working to implement that. I'll do my best. Well, thanks so much for joining us today at the Drexel interview. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's a pleasure to be, be here. Okay. And thank you for joining us today for the Drexel interview.